we are going to finish up what we were talking about with um, goodness. I wanted to finish it last week. I wanted it already to be on Obadiah, but la that storm last week, I was like, we're just going to play this safe. I was just imagining Chuck trying to come over on full power with his, with his uh, thing cranked to 10 or whatever, and it's all blowing up. <laughs> okay. So um, a lot of this will just be finishing up ideas that we started with on um, two weeks ago and four weeks ago. So what are morals uh, and the heart of them? And we're going to look at more a little bit deep, deeper than the just simple idea of, oh, morals is, is knowing what to do. Well, let's look a little bit more at that. Morals um, are doing good things, but they're also living by a standard. Having morals is when you have a standard that you live by, but it's also doing good things. Um, are morals objective or subjective? And what I mean by that is, is a moral uh, just something that is an absolute yes or no that exists like – separate from all things or is it something that's subjective to my experience for instance it's wrong for me to do this and there's this argument going on going on that situational ethics are not a thing um, situational ethics are where something is wrong in a certain situation but as much as christians like to argue against that that's just not true morals can be objective and subjective there there is such a thing as, as situational ethics some things are wrong at a time and some things are wrong with a certain attitude, and I'll, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Um, but one thing that's increasing, in, in, in incredibly important whenever we're wrapping up this discussion about goodness is that perfection is not the goal. We cannot be good. Christianity is not about being better. Perfection is not the goal. Trusting God is. God does a work in us. He's making us. He will. He will be making us perfect. Yes. But when the Bible talks about us being um, perfect like in the book of James is talking about us reaching maturity not um, the uh, non-existence of sin God is the only one who can make us perfect and that will be in the resurrection when we will have resurrected bodies we will be incapable of sinning okay um, so morals are based off of a deeper absolute and that's that's how we're kind of gonna have to this is the only other way I know how to how to clarify this this idea. So rape, for instance, is always wrong, regardless of, of what time you live in, um, what society you live in. Rape is always wrong. And a judge judging fairly, that's always going to be right. And the reason why that is is because of who God is. Most people have this idea of goodness and that we've been looking at for the, for the past couple weeks. And it's, it's this, hey, I can be good. Based off this erroneous idea of what morals are, that there's just this, oh, I know, I'll know what's right and I'll know what's wrong. And we've looked over this for the past couple months. We can't always know that. Um, but the, so how, how we get around that is that morals are based off of a deeper absolute than just simply saying that there is a moral idea. And that, that deeper absolute is God's character. God's character and essence is what makes things not relative. Rape is wrong because of who God is, because of the standard that he has created, because of um, the idea of morality that he himself has embedded inside of our skulls. So what if you mean to do something good, but you do bad accidentally? Like, for instance, what if this just judge, he's trying to judge fairly, but he ends up accidentally judging unfairly on accident. He, he, he does something immoral on accident, trying to give a fair uh, ruling. What, what does that mean? It, was it moral for him or was it immoral for him because he did, in fact, intend to do, to do something that was moral? And it's not as simple as that. And um, so, I mean, I've explained as much as I can, so it's best to just say this. Do the best you know to do and don't do what you know you shouldn't do. And at the end of the day, that has to be good enough. Because, remember, it's not about your perfection, your ability to do everything good and right at all times. You will be incapable of that. You will sin without even knowing that you are sinning because you are do not have a faultless character and essence like God himself does. So that's why it comes back down to, down to this. How can I truly obey and trust God if I'm sinning without even knowing it? You do the best job you can, but you're trusting in God, not in your perfection. That's why I, 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 I stressed out the point that it, it, perfection is not the goal of Christianity. Laws. So, how does how does how does the idea then of morals, objective and subjective and situational, all these different things, how does that connect with the with the biblical law? 
A lot of times people go to the law of the Old Testament as though it is the standard of ultimate right and wrong, and that's just not true. It's hard to say, did the law come from God? Yes. Doesn't that mean that those standards are absolute? No. Well, hold on. Didn't you say it was from God? God never changes. And right and wrong, it can't be situational. It has to be absolute. And it's like, yes, there is an absolute standard. But now let's look at this. How can, how can the law not have absolutes? Hold on. Laws, the laws, are morals applied to specific situations. Okay, for instance, the law says not to mark yourself. This is a reference to the, uh, to the occult practice of the time that was associated with marking yourself for the dead. It was an occultic practice, and God told the people back then not to do it. We don't really do that anymore, so the law doesn't really carry much weight. But the law, was it moral? Well, yes, at the time, as it applied to that specific situation. It was a situational ethic. Us as Christians were free from the law, but we're not free from morality. Um, but with that being said, just a little side note, uh, marking yourself is not tattoos, it's it's not tattoos, so just don't get sidetracked on that. The law did show morals, but not everything in the law is what should happen. Jesus talks about this. For instance, a good example is divorce. He says, you know, divorce, that's not, God didn't want people to get divorced, but because of your hardness of heart, he knew that that's what was going to happen, so he made a way through the law. So the law didn't always show something that should happen, but not only that, not everything in the law is moral. When I first figured this out, it kind of blew me away a little bit. And I'll say it again just in case you didn't hear me the first time. Not everything in the biblical law is moral. It's not an absolute standard for all time. It says, for instance, trimming the edges of your beard. This is not really immoral. It's something that is that is applying a something in the culture to the moral. The moral is love the Lord your God with all your heart. You're, you're, you're worshiping God and him alone. You might say, what does all this have to do? This sounds like a whole lot of nonsense. What does this have to do with goodness? Well, we're looking at the idea of goodness, which begs the question, what is goodness? What is morals? Where do morals come from? And how does the biblical law fit into that? So we're just wrapping up a lot of the things that we've been talking about over the past couple uh, weeks. It might be a little bit dry, I admit that, but these are things that nevertheless have to be discussed, at least in passing. Um, so as far as the modern law, not, not the biblical law, but the modern law that we follow in the U.S., um, those are more based off of a common consensus of what people generally believe to be right and wrong, not really absolute truth. Um, a lot of people kind of bring up the thing of, oh, the law shows God's character. No, not so much. Um, not so much. Um, the biblical law doesn't ch um, doesn't change, though. As, as culture has changed, the biblical law hasn't changed. Um, and so because of that, the biblical law doesn't really apply well to our modern society. So what we have to do is we have to read it. And study it so that we can apply it to today. So where, where we can go through and say, okay, the law says this. What does that mean to me today? And then we can find the absolute deeper um, standard for a situational ethic, if that makes sense. So one more thing that's worth mentioning about the law, and then this will be the last thing we say about the law. We're going to move on. Um, is there's two ideas with the law. There's the letter of the law, and there's the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is like the hyper-literal. Um, so it's, it says, for instance... Um, hey, don't mark your bodies, so following the law would be, I'm following literally exactly what the law says. But then there's a spirit of the law, this is the purpose of the law, the reason why it was written. Um, it would be the difference between saying what the, what the law means and what it actually says. Um, a good example of this would be the Pharisees with the Sabbath. The Pharisees knew what the law was with the Sabbath, they knew what their human tradition was with the Sabbath, but they failed to comprehend the purpose of the Sabbath. And when Jesus was talking to them, he said, okay... You you were not created for the purpose of fulfilling the Sabbath. See what he's doing is he's making a making a statement about morals. But the Sabbath was made for you. You're missing you're missing the purpose. You're you're getting the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. This is important because whenever we're talking about morals and goodness and what we should and shouldn't do as Christians, the question always comes: Does what does the Bible have to say about this? Does the Bible say not to do this? Well, see, that's once again the difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And whenever you're having a discussion about goodness and what is morals, you really have to go a little bit past the surface. James 2, 9 through 11 says this, if you, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. 
For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do, if you do not commit adultery but do, do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. And his point is this. If you are a lawbreaker, you're a lawbreaker. People have this idea that my sin is better than, that, than their, that person's sin. If you're a lawbreaker, you're a lawbreaker. It doesn't matter if you're a murderer, a liar. It, it, if you're a lawbreaker, you're a lawbreaker. A lawbreaker is someone who breaks the law, whether small or big. God was the same one who gave this law and that law. So if you small, fell in this small law, but you do this big law, you're still a lawbreaker. What, what we like to do is we like to overlook that. Oh, I'm still good because I don't fell on the big laws. I fell on the small laws. So you're a lawbreaker. We are not good. <laughs> I, I'm trying to show you this at every angle so you can fully understand the concept of, of goodness and, and why the question that I asked a month ago is just not really based on reality. So now we get to the real fatal questions about the about the idea of goodness. If it's about being good, then how good is good enough? It never is good enough. You always have to do more. Think about the guy who went to Jesus and said, hey, what what good thing do I have to do? And, G and, and he said, oh, do this. And, oh, well, I've done all that. He knew that there was something he was missing. How do you get rid of bad things? The answer, there is no way to get rid of bad things. A bad thing is a bad thing. It's, it's there. Is the social gospel good? Some people make it out to be that Christianity is nothing more than, than a social gospel. Jesus doesn't really matter. You don't really need to be saved. You're not really that bad. You just do good things, and then God will look on that and smile. Well, that sounds good, but here's the thing. If, if you see someone drowning and you bake them a cake, is that good? Doing good things is good and necessary. Social aspects of the gospel, that's good and necessary, but insufficient. It's like baking somebody who's drowning a cake. Yeah, it was a nice gesture, I guess, but it really didn't solve the problem. They're still drowning. The social gospel stops at temporary needs rather than starting there. See, the social gospel makes its whole purpose not the glory and the glory of Jesus, but in solving a temporary problem. So with that being said, let's let's tie some ideas up here and separate the difference between goodness, morals, and doing good things. God cares what we do. Our actions do matter. We we might not ever reach the character of God's goodness, but what we do does matter, and God cares what we do. When we do good things from a forgiven heart, they are worshipped to God, but good deeds are ignored if, by God if the heart is in rebellion to him. We looked at this before. When you do something for the least, when you do something for, for, for people who, who don't deserve it and everybody else looks, looks down on, you do it for God. And that is an honor to God. Yes, absolutely. So you're saying that I can earn my forgiveness? No. I'm saying it honor God. You can do a good thing that honors God, that helps people. And that's a good thing to do, but that doesn't make you good. And although it's a moral thing to do, you get what I'm saying. So, <clears throat> God will sometimes bless those who don't deserve it. This is just a fact of life. Um, I don't know exactly why, but sometimes you see people doing all kinds of good, and they die young, and you know whatever. And then some people who are just incredibly terrible people, living to ripe old ages. Um, and so God will sometimes bless those who don't deserve it. It's not. It's not like some you know. Uh, formula to living long or something um and god will oftentimes give mercy to rebels who show mercy now this is something that that astounds me sometimes god will show mercy even though they're not forgiven even though there's you know they're still guilty of their sin sometimes god will show mercy to people because they did something that was merciful i don't exactly know how that works in with everything it doesn't make the person good it doesn't make up for their sin but somehow it's like god has like just this mercy that he just gives because he feels like being merciful. Um, if you know, if you remember, if you weren't, maybe you weren't there, but I, I talked, uh, I, I preached about um, the time when when Jesus is talking to the to the pagan woman and she's saying, "Hey, you know, heal my daughter," and he's like, "You know, I I came for the children. I'm not going to throw the food over to the dogs." And she says, "But even the dogs get to eat the crumbs." Um, and I made the point that the dogs were still in the house. God still gave opportunity even to those who don't deserve it. And that's one of the kind of things I kind of want to point out. Nobody deserves it. Not even the children deserved it. So that's kind of an important thing. So what is Christianity, Christianity really all about? We looked, at, we looked at all these things that it's not about. We looked at the idea of goodness. We, we, we looked at a very dry discussion on what morals are and how the law fits with morals. And, you know, just... All these different things, but now we have to come back to the main question that we asked. 
what is Christianity all about? Christianity is not about being a good person or being better. This is extremely important because everybody nowadays makes it out to be like Christianity is about being better. If I'm not doing drugs, I don't need to go to church. Um, you know, hey, God works for you. That's fine. I've found my own way. Um, you know, I, I see people in that church. who I, I know them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. Christianity is not about being being a better person so you can lord it over someone else. Christianity is about trusting God and trusting in God with the realization that you will never be perfect. So you're trusting God, realizing that you're not, not perfect, but also not sinning high-handed. Sinning high-handed is where you sin on purpose and you're just like, hey, it doesn't matter, I'm going to be forgiven. Um, it, it, first John puts like this, we walk in the light as he is in the light. It says we confess our sins. We, we don't lie about having a sin nature. Um, so then, you know, we all, people make, make the argument that Christians, you know, different things about us being perfect, how trying to be perfect or all these different things, perfectionists and all these different things. The idea of perfect is mostly ob arbitrary. You, you have to ask the question, perfect by whose standard? And what I mean by that, let, let me, let me ask, let me kind of dive, go a little bit off here. Okay. Imagine this, not even God lives in the black and white lines that we think exist. For instance, wasn't it God who ordered the slaughtering of the Canaanites? In our mind, we would say that that's a bad thing. But yet he still did it, and we know that he's good. Do you see the problem? We just said, hey, we, we're, we're trying to be perfect. Well, perfect by whose standards? God doesn't even, and doesn't even reach up to our standards of perfection by what we think perfect is. Maybe we're the ones who are wrong. That's what I'm getting at. God is good, but our understanding is fragmented. Perfect is not attainable for us. Perfection isn't even the goal for us. Trusting and obeying is, and God will make us perfect when he gives us the resurrection. I already talked about this at the beginning. So when are we no longer a Christian with sinning? Oh boy, I don't know. I don't know. But I will say this, you will get to a place of abandoning your salvation. And I know that God is faithful to carry past our failures. So where is the line where we lose our salvation or where we give it up or whatever? I don't know. I know that we don't lose our salvation every time that we stumble. And I know that we don't have to try to be perfect. So where does that put it? Can we can we it can we get to a place of not sinning on purpose but accepting our sin as a reality of our life but then still trying? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. These are all things that I think are are worth you guys thinking about. I've tried to look at this in different different ways. And try and help you guys, but ultimately I think that this is something that I can't give you a solid answer on. It's something that you have to learn and grow and seek God for yourself on. Christianity is not a one and done. It's a continual turning to God. Sometimes we get this idea in our head that, you know, I got saved and then, you know, I, um, you know, I can go do whatever I want now. And it's like, no, no, Christianity isn't like that. We're, we're trusting in God day to day. We're, we're taking up our cross and following him as it is. Um, so Christianity obviously requires effort. But effort to live for God. I'm not saying that since we can't be perfect, we shouldn't have. We should have no effort. We should have effort to live for God and seek Him every day. But we shouldn't have effort to try to be perfect, but to seek Him and live for Him. Somehow we've gotten to the point of equating trusting and obeying with perfection, and those are two different things. Trusting and obeying is I'm going to sin. I'm trying not to, but I'm going to. I'm not perfect. I need God to carry me through this. Perfection is I don't need God. I, I I'm good. Why I bring this up is because a lot of people who struggle with things like, well, you think of pornography, right? Um, you know, I, I can get over this on my own where I won't need God ever again and I'll just be perfect and I won't ever mess up ever again. Well, it doesn't really work like that. So here's our scale. This is how we understand good and bad. There's bad, that would be like, well, but Hitler in this category. There's average, that's us. And then there's good, that's like God. There may be people who do more bad things than others and worse bad things, but only God is good. This scale that we have in our minds, it doesn't exist. We need Jesus to make us justified in God's perfect sight. So that means that the scale looks more like this. There's good and there's bad. That's God, and everything that's not God is, is bad, and everything that is God is good. And then there's forgiven and unforgiven. So there's uh, people who... How look to trust and obey in God and people who don't. It's either that we're children of God or we're not children of God. 
God isn't on the scale of forgiven, forgiven and unforgiven because he doesn't need forgiveness. The problem is, is that we compare ourselves to ourselves, and that's just not, not a real smart thing to do. So one thing that I kind of I kind of asked myself this question when I was writing this lesson was, is there even a scale of good and bad? Or is that completely in our imaginations? And the truth is, I'm not sure. I know that we don't have an excuse to sin, but I'm not sure much past that. In the prophet Habakkuk, for instance, he, he, the, the prophet says this. He says, okay, God, these bad people are taking, taking advantage of these, of these people, these good people. And I, you know, I'm one of the good people, and there's these bad people, and they're taking advantage. And so God says, okay, well, I'm bringing punishment. And so Habakkuk says, but the people you're punishing us with are even worse. See, this was a scale that he thought existed too. Good, average, bad. I'm good. I'm the prophet. Then there's average. That would be, you know, these people who are mistreating us. But then there's bad. That would be like the Babylonians that you're bringing to, to, to God. You, you, you don't realize what you're doing here. Habakkuk didn't understand that we are not good. So I, I brought up the thing about how we teach our kids in, in, in Sunday school and, and in kids' church and all these different things about being good, do the right thing and all this different stuff, which is good. We should teach our kids to be good. But we should also, also ask what is good and why is it good? So let's – let's. there's two more specific things that we need to look at before we wrap up this discussion. First off, what about people who have never heard? Will they go to heaven or will they go to hell? Let me give you a series of observations, and then I'll point to, and I'll move on. First off, no one deserves to be saved. God doesn't owe anyone salvation. Second off, God apparently judges different people according to the situation. Okay. Third off, Jesus is the only way to be saved. Okay. Fourth off, we all have the witness of nature and our own conscience. Okay. Fifth, not everyone gets the same chance. Even though we all have the same witness of nature in our conscience, not everyone gets the same chance. And God is not obligated to fairness. That brings me to my conclusion on the matter. Ultimately, we don't know, and we don't get to decide. I would say that oftentimes we miss a golden opportunity with this, and we ought to reach a place of saying, Thank you, God, for giving me the chance. I'll go tell others, rather than judging God ungratefully because he didn't give somebody else a chance. I don't know how that works out. Let God be God, and you just have to... You just have to embrace the idea that you don't know. In, in Matthew, the last thing that Jesus says is he tells us to go. He doesn't say that we have to know everything. We are told to go, not to know everything. And I think that's incredibly important because we will not know everything. So what the Bible has to say about this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God's ways aren't even in our atmosphere. It's beyond our atmosphere. So let's give some answers to these questions that we've asked for the past month. Getting past goodness, our goodness, all this different stuff, let, let's, let's take it as a series of, of questions and answers. First off, should we do good things? Yes. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't kill the... Okay, yes. What is good? Conformity to God's character. It's an absolute reality. Goodness is, is, an, is an absolute. It's not relevant, relative to the individual. It's not invented. It can be applied to the individual where it is situational, but it's not. There's, it's still based on a deeper reality. It's not based off of the things uh, most philosophy bases goodness and ethics and morality from. So if you ever take like a philosophy class, they'll get this idea of you know right and wrong, and, all, and they'll, they'll base it off of nonsense. There are arguments out there for the, for those things, and you know. But, but here's the problem: is they all try to try to they're void of God, and they try to remove Him from the equation. And ultimately, they're they're based on this argument that just doesn't hold up. So, should we do good? Yes. What is good for conformity to God's to God's character? Why is it good? Because God is the giver of morality. It's not based on my society. It's based on God's character. It's good because God says so. He has a standard. Lying is against God's truthfulness. It's against justice's goodness. If I go into a court and I lie to the judge, that in itself is just a wicked thing. We know it's a wicked thing. It goes against the idea of justice. So can we be good? We're doing good things. Does that mean that we can be good? No, we can do good things. God has an incorruptible character and doesn't change. 
We do not. We lack that divine essence. We are not gods, which is a lot different than you're going to hear from a lot of televangelists. And so then the last of these questions here, why should you do good? Not just that we should teach our kids to do good, to discern what is good and why it is good, and explain to them the difference between being good and... Well, I'm just not good enough. Well, you don't really have to be. But then why should you do good? Not just telling our kids, hey, you should do good. You shouldn't lie. Why should you do good? A very important distinction that I think is missing from most, most kids' curriculum. Because God is the judge and we are accountable for our actions. Everybody can do good things. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't need God to do good things. Yes, but why should you do good things? That's a whole different question. God is the absolute ruler. Our rebellion doesn't change that. We should do good because there is such a thing as good and therefore an absolute element. And that absolute element is God. That's the quickest way that I can summarize this whole thing about goodness and where we fit on this and how our actions apply. We should do good because there is such a thing as good, as, uh, good and therefore an absolute element, God. Doing good, doing good is the single greatest declaration of God's existence and our faith in that God. If we say that there's a, a God but then we don't do anything to show it, there is nothing in us that declares God's character, God's essence. God's character of goodness demands that we help others, that we love those who are unlovable, that we bring justice in situations that have no justice. That's his character. And when he said in the very beginning that he made us in his image, that means that he made us in his stead. He put us to do a job carrying out his hands and feet. And doing that, accepting the reality of, 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 of action, is the declaration of God. James was kind of talked about this a little bit when he says, you know, if you say, I have faith, but there's no works, then your faith is dead. Doing good is the single greatest declaration of God's existence. It doesn't make me good. It doesn't earn me salvation, but it's a declaration of God's existence. And our faith in that God, in the image, means act in his stead. Okay, so the very last thing that we will say about, about this whole conversation on goodness, I hope it's... Um, I hope it was as fun for you guys to learn and talk about this as it was for me to study it. I spent a lot, a lot of time studying this. The conscience declaration of right and wrong. So in our head, we know that, that there's right and wrong. Our desire to be good and good deeds done. All three of those things are witnesses of a greater power's existence. And I'll say those two things again. Our, our conscience's declaration of right and wrong, that we know that there's such a thing as right and wrong. Our desire to be good, our desire to do right, and good deeds done, the, the good things that are done, those all three things are witnesses of a greater power's existence. Refusing them, now understand what I'm saying here, if I, if I refuse those things, it will mute God to me. I will be dimmed to the revelation of God. And others will be dimmed through my inaction. But it doesn't remove the reality of his existence. It doesn't make good the sta his standard not a thing anymore. God is self-sufficient and, and, and independent, but it will affect my relationship with God and other people's relationship with God through my example. So, we are done with, with, with the discussion of goodness. Any, any questions or comments before I move on? I am sorry about this. This last part was a little bit heftier than I did intend it to be, but yeah, nothing can be done about it, I guess. Goodness is a heavy topic, I guess. We're all good?